All right, uh, we are live. Um, this is a mic check. We're just going see. What's up, I mean, people actually show up first and foremost. Okay. So like we got seven people right now. Okay. Sixteen. How's the sound? I can hear you perfectly. All right, you can hear me perfectly. I'm asking the audience. Oh, okay. All right, they say it's good. All right, cool. We'll just go ahead and get started. All right, guys. So this is a um, live stream I'm doing with Mr. Duran Williams. Um, I came across his channel when I first started my channel. I was uh, listening to some of his commentary and I thought it was interesting. I thought it was good. Um, it really uh, piqued my interest. And uh, what kind of ha happened was is that I started talking to him um, on his channel. I would comment and then he comment on my channel and just kind of went back and forth and then eventually um i think a couple weeks ago or make a week ago he had reached out and he wanted to do a show about um investing and um financial literacy and, and generational wealth and, and credit and to talk about some things that are i feel like <laughs> more important to talk about in politics uh and, you know for the individual right at the individual level so i thought it was a good idea to um take a turn with my channel a little bit and just, you know, talk about something a little bit different besides politics. My background, if you guys don't know, uh, is in investment management management and financial planning. Um, so I have, you know, experience and knowledge about stocks, bonds, uh, traditional IRA, uh, Roth IRA, uh, 401ks, uh, Roth conversions, um, things of that nature, uh, trust administration, basic level of knowledge on that. Cause that can get real complicated, but that's my background. Um, so, you know, I hope to answer you guys questions, um, that you guys have, you know, about IRAs and investing stocks, bonds, mutual funds, whatever. And, um, I will let, um, Mr. Duran Williams introduce himself and what his core competencies are. What's up, folks? How you guys doing out there? Uh, I want to give a quick shout out to the people who are in right now. Uh, Miss Ann Strelendorf, Mr. Poor Man Printing, Stephanie Mumbo, Craig Patterson, and Rubber Band. That's a dope name, by the way. Yeah, so my name is Duran Williams, and I started out as a loan officer back in 2000. And this was back when interest rates were at 9.5%. And, um, and so I was a loan officer for a while, and what I learned is that people who save and people keep their credit good, those are people who make it. Those are people who own houses, own nice cars, send their kids to college, and then set up retirement. And I know that Ice Cube was in the news lately, and um, you know that's, that's his whole thing. And I know there's a lot of uh, different opinions about Ice Cube. You know, you know, did he sell out, or is he trying to do the right thing for the brothers? What he's doing is focusing on economics. Because for the past six months, we have been inundated with police brutality and racism, and, and those things are important. But at the same time, it's not necessarily a color thing, the reason why we're down, because the average African that comes to America, they open up businesses just like the Asians and the Mexicans and the Middle Easterns do. So it's not necessarily a color thing. That's our problem. It's economics, mostly. And, I, and of course, you know, the, the family situation, you know, we got to get more fathers in the house, but mainly economics. So once you get your economics there, then it will lessen some of the issues we deal with when it comes to color. You know, we, we will no longer be looked at as black. We'll be looked at as successful and we need to be treated as such. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, and I think that you make a good point about how all these other uh, groups can come over here and be successful and to found a footing and get a little slice of the American pie. But yet, you know, you find, you know, black Americans still kind of 
you know, um, asking, why don't we have, you know, ours? What, what don't we, why yeah. can't we have what they have? And yeah. I feel like for me personally, it, it, it really comes down to focusing on uh, saving and investing, saving, invest over time. We know that the stock market is one of the greatest tools that we can use to generate wealth over almost a hundred year history of the stock market. The average return is seven to 10%. Yeah. That's what is generally yeah. agreed upon, 7 10% return. And again, yeah. that is an appreciating asset. And a lot of people don't understand the difference between an appreciating asset and a depreciating asset. An appreciating asset is an asset that's going to appreciate in value over time. It's going to make you more money over time, right? So like a house, yeah. um, a stock, your business, uh, for example. Um, some people would say um, gold, even though gold is pretty volatile um, i'm not a big fan of precious metals to be quite honest with you but they you know they, they deserve a certain spot in your portfolio um a yeah, balance long portfolio. term because if yeah, you had long, gold in 1980 yeah imagine it's worth now yeah exactly you, know, you pass it, it on to 40 years you know exactly yeah. you know, gold gold holds its value over time it, it it does i just i'm not a big fan of the volatility that's what i'm saying yeah yeah, um, I, yeah. <laughs> I am you are yeah you are yeah i mean that's and that's fine i'm a maverick um, <laughs> yeah, so I'm a I'm a fan of of long term approach, diversified portfolio, and what I mean by diversified portfolio, that means being invested across the market as a whole, right? So we're talking about investing in the stock market. That means um, investing across the market, being in a little bit of everything, and also your portfolio isn't just the stock market. It can also be what you have in real estate. It could also be your small business, it can be all your investments um, can comprise yeah. your portfolio. And you should never put all of your eggs in one basket, which is why I am a big fan of, again, um, using diversified mutual funds to grow your wealth over time. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I want to read a quick comment from Laura Lee. She says, my husband and I own three homes, rent out two, all three paid in full. Anyone can do this. Absolutely. Laura Lee. Great, beautiful, beautiful. That's what you're supposed to do. And you don't have to be rich to own a home. You do not have to be rich because I'm in California where homes were, were not too well to do homes. I was going to say the word S H I T, but whatever. But, but even bad homes, they're worth about a million dollars where I'm at. I'm in Orange County, California. But you don't have to buy here. Even if you're a California resident, you can buy in Georgia or Oklahoma, or Ohio, or Florida, and get homes in the cheap to rent out. So it's not always have to be rich, have to have $100,000. You can start out small. You can start with 15, 20,000. And a lot of times you can borrow that money. You don't necessarily have to come with cash. So yeah, invest in real estate if you can. If you guys got 30, 40,000 lying around, look for a piece of property. That, that's, a, that's definitely a good way to invest. Yeah, shout out to Laura Lee. Absolutely. And um, we got a super chat already from Sean Myers. Uh, thanks for the stream, IUL, which is a, a index universal life insurance. I, I believe that's what it is versus 401k, which is better. Now, I'm not an expert in insurance. Um, I'm, in a, I'm all about securities, right? So stocks, bonds, mutual funds, index funds. That's my, um, my um, <clears throat> expertise. So I don't know that much about the index universal life insurance, but um, from what I'm reading here, it looks like it does use some um, index fund properties in order to uh, to appreciate over time versus the typical uh, life insurance uh, tools that are used um, with that. Now, versus a 401k, I'll say this. 401k is probably the best thing that you can invest with, especially if your company matches. If your company matches, then that's basically free money. It's free money. Yeah. And you should max out your 401k before you basically try to invest in anything else. If you're investing strictly for retirement, if you're investing for retirement purposes, everything you go that goes into your 401k is before tax, which means you don't pay taxes on it now. And when you take it out later, you pay tax on it based on your income when you take it out. But like I said, when it comes to 401k, it's almost impossible to beat it because if your company matches, you're getting free money. 
Uh, Dave yeah. Ramsey is good. He's he's good. I think he's good for more practical. What can you do in your your personal life and helping people? Um, you know, um, figure out okay, like what debt do I need to get rid of? Um, what I need to do um, when it comes to you know my budget and things of that nature. Uh, but I haven't really heard him talk much specifically about um, investing. Um, but kind of back to that super chat. Yeah, 401k is 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 it, it doesn't get much better than that. If, if your company matches, make sure you max it out and then you can start to kind of go into maybe a Roth IRA for after tax um, investing, which if you're young a Roth IRA is the way to go. And the reason yeah. why is because. When you're young, you're going to make less money more likely than you are when you're going to be in retirement, right? So that means that you pay lower taxes now, and we all know that tax rates go up over time. You pay lower taxes now, and then you get tax-free returns, compound interest, um, appreciation over time by investing in the stock market. And then once you take that money out, all of it comes out tax-free. So if you're young... You're in your 20s. You cannot beat a Roth IRA unless, you know, again, 401k, do that first. But after you max that out and you want more, the Roth IRA is a great tool for building wealth because that after tax, um, you know, tax free, taking out your money tax free uh, long term. When you're 50, 60 years old, you got one, two million dollars in that account. You, you can't beat it. Yeah. One thing about uh, 401ks, too. You have to protect it. You have to have stock options against your 401k. So let's say that your company stock is at $100. And it's just sitting at $100. You have about $100,000 in 401k. If that thing falls, like let's say there's a crash and that thing is at $40 all of a sudden, if you have protections, if you have stock options to where if there's a crash, you get paid, then once it drops, your hundred thousand dollars could turn to about 150, 170, 200. You get you get paid a huge insurance premium for that. And a lot of people they'll let they'll they'll just let it free. They won't have any protections against it. So when a market crashes, their 401k will go from a hundred thousand to twenty thousand. But if you have protections and there's a crash, you can actually make money during a crash. So think about stock options. I don't want to get into what they are. It's a, it's a 20 minute explanation but <laughs> if you have a 401k right now get stock options get put options you know you want to put money against whatever the company stock is so once it drops you get paid you know you'll go for years without getting paid you'll put five ten thousand whatever into it but eventually that five thousand you put in per year it will turn to hundreds of thousands if there's a crash. So just one thing I want to touch on about that. Um, let me just read a couple more of these um, comments. Uh, M. Weber 555, uh, when when all one cares about is the newest phone, shoes, cars, that person will have a very hard time generating any savings or wealth. Let, let, let's touch on the big spending. I'll, I'll let you I'll let you go ahead. But the big Wait, spending- Wait, repeat that, that, repeat that. One, repeat that, I, uh, I was looking up something, go ahead. Oh, yeah, that's, that's fine. They're just talking about just spending big. Instead of like, you know, you get a check for $1,000, 800 goes on shoes and clothes. Let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. So I'm a, let me talk about options real quick. Yeah. Um. Now, the thing about options, guys, um, like I said, I, me personally, um, I'm not a big fan of options for people that are beginners. I, you know, I, I definitely if you have more experience and you understand, um, you know, contracts, and, you know, how they work and the time value of them, then, yes, you can experiment with them. But for beginners, I, I would say stick to keep it simple, broad, diversified yeah. mutual funds and focus on your asset allocation, which means yeah. that and this I'm going to get a little bit deeper here in terms of um, how to set up your investment po portfolio, particularly if you're young. Right. So remember what I said, guys, is that. When you're young, if you're in your 20s or 30s, you're going to want to take more risk because if you take more risk, then you allow yourself to get more growth and you can take advantage of uh, time. Right. So it doesn't matter what the volatility of your portfolio is, which means in the short term, it's going to go up and down. But since you're not going to be taking that money until you retire or when you go and buy a house or if your investment time horizon is long, then it doesn't matter whether or not it goes up and down. 
All you need to do is just keep investing and keep investing. And yeah. you don't need to be an expert in individual stocks, guys. You can buy the whole market, right? So, for example, you can buy the total stock market. Buy the total stock market. And you can make your whole portfolio. And I recommend if you're young and you have an investment time horizon of 10 to 30 years or even to retirement, if you're in your 20s or 30s, 90% of your portfolio should be in the total stock market. That way you're getting a little bit of everything. And then maybe 10% of your, fo your portfolio can be in the total bond market, which means you can have exposure to the bond market in general. Yeah. Now, over time, as you get over, older or your investment time horizon um, shortens, you can change your asset allocation to maybe 50-50. Maybe you're 50% stock, so you're 50% the total stock market, and then you're 50% the total bond market that way yeah. you have less volatility in your portfolio and as you get ready to start withdrawing your funds you're not exposed to the volatility of the marketplace as such for example let's say that you know you are looking to retire this year or you wanted to get your money this year now pre-covid if you were 100 percent invested in stocks and you didn't see that crash coming and you wanted to retire in april you would have been screwed. You would have been screwed. Um, yeah. Because your portfolio wasn't allocated right. And that's and that and that's because you needed the money at that time. Now, if your portfolio was 50% bonds and 50% stocks, or maybe even you know, 70 to 80 percent bonds and 20% to 30 percent stocks, then your portfolio wouldn't have been as volatile and you probably would have kept a lot of your funds. Now the thing is, is that, again, when you're young, you can take more risk. Don't worry about trying to make a lot of money up front. That's not how it works. And all you need to worry about is just keep putting money in there over time, over time, over time. That's that's all you have to keep doing. Now, when it comes to saving, which is what I think Duran was getting into um, when he was asking me about. For example, when you're when you're young, and I keep saying young because... This is people want to talk about building generational wealth. You have to start when you're young. For example, if you contribute six thousand dollars to an IRA every single year, which is five hundred dollars a month for 40 years, your total investment is going to be two thousand and four. I mean, sorry, um, two hundred and forty thousand dollars. Now, at the beginning of this, you remember how I mentioned about the seven to ten percent return per year. If you did that five hundred dollars a month for 40 years. Your investment would be $1.37 million if you got a 7% return per year by the time yes. you're 57. You're yes. a millionaire at 57 years old. So, you know, when I talk about building generational wealth, when I talk about how there is no excuse, how anybody can be a millionaire and how you can make it work, the math is there, guys. We have a 100 year of history of the stock market to prove that if you just use the stock market, you can build wealth. You can build generational wealth. However, it takes sacrificing over time to get it done. And I'm not saying that, you know, you should just limit yourself to the stock market. However, that is the most easily, easily accessible tool for building wealth that you have that you can't. There's no excuse for you not to be invested in it because that's what people that build wealth do. They invest in the stock market, even the, even the guys that are uh, ultra wealthy. We're talking about 20, 30 million dollars. Most of their portfolio is in the stock market. Now, they may be in some hedge funds. They may be in some private equity funds. They may be doing something a little bit more extravagant and sophisticated. Yeah, real estate. Yeah. But those basic principles that I'm talking about still apply no matter what. Yeah. And uh, just to touch on that, um, you know, and, and back to the options, you have you have what you call trading options. And you have what you call options that are attached to your portfolio. Trading options, that is for gamblers. That is for people with money to burn. <laughs> yeah. Don't even think about trading options. <laughs> but what I mean is um, having stock options against your 401k. And you can buy stock, stock options out to about 18 months. So every 18 months, it's, it's like car insurance. Every 18 months, you put that insurance on there. So just in case your $100 company stock drops, 
you'll get paid if it drops to 40 to 60 to 80. You'll get paid every time it does. And then you re-up. So I'm not talking about trading options. That's a whole different thing. Um, but getting options against, um, that that's what um, – that's the best thing to do if you if you have 401k because I have a family member if they would have had stock options back when uh, cuz they worked at Bank of America and if they would have had stock options back in 2008 instead of them losing 100,000 they would have gained 200,000 just that simple thing of buying their options you know they would have paid a few thousand throughout the years but once it crashed they would have got paid and also um, you know he talked about saving 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 early and i'm talking about in your 20s because that's when we spend all wild in our 20s um but if you just save just a little bit it could be 150 a month 250 a month but it can grow and like greg said it can grow to 3.7 million 4 million 5 million because of compound interest you know seven percent over 20 years on the surface it looks like 140 percent but it's actually two thousand percent or, or more because of compound interest. So each five years that you invest, it's going to compound. So anything, any any sort of growth is going to be huge exponentially. So if you have a 4%, if you have a 7 whatever it is, it's going to grow hugely. Like he said, about the $3.7 million, the person he described was not a millionaire. The person he described wasn't a high-powered lawyer or a banker nope. or a doctor. Nope. They had a regular job, assistant manager at Walmart, and then moved up to general manager in the thirties. <laughs> <laughs> you know, making making forty grand a year, but they have three point seven million after thirty years of work. And you can do the same thing just by simple saving, and also just um, just basic cutting things out. Yes, you could go to a movie twice a week, but how about you go to a movie once a week and then rent the DVD and get some popcorn? Just, just simple things. Yeah, yeah, no, and I think people people get mad um, that, you know, people, conservatives make arguments about, like, oh, you shouldn't be buying Starbucks. You know, if you didn't buy Starbucks and you had an expensive phone, you'd be a lot better off. People get mad about it, but that's true. It's 100% true advice, right? Like yeah. you, $500 a month, can be 1.37 million yeah in 30 years and again and that's why you know when i hear people like ice cube talk about building generational wealth and diddy you know come out talking about you know why we don't have this why we don't have that you know being in the investment management industry you know i i kind of it turns me off a lot because it's one of those things where i see people that have their houses are worth less than their cars Right. Yeah. And, and, and again, when putting money now, imagine, like I said, you, you know, you put five hundred dollars a month, you max out your IRA, you know, Roth IRA every single month. You got a million dollars at 50, 60 years old. Now, some you now the argument that there's an argument you made that a million dollars is not enough to retire on. But it also depends on what you're because you're supposed to take four percent out per year in retirement. But it just depends on your lifestyle. But regardless you can get there. And if you have a million to $2 million, you know, by the time you retire and it's not taxed at all and it's coming out tax free, that that's money. That's nothing, but that's, you can't ask for anything better than that. And that tool is available for everybody and not enough people want to talk about that. Um, and it is, it, it's very simple, right? And it's something where we try to make something that is very simple, overly complicated, when it's not, it's very simple. All the tools are there. So go ahead. Yeah. And see, the thing about saving is it's not trying to, you know, mess your lifestyle up. You can have the same lifestyle. You can have the nice cars. You can have a little jewelry, but it's how you purchase it. It's how you spend it. Look for deals. Hey, look for hand-me-downs. You know, I mean, it's different ways you, you can do things. Um, besides trying to get the new and the newest and the freshest. Now, these are not just uh, middle class people like us talking to you about this. Millionaire NBA players have said this. It's an uh, old school center. His name was Samuel Dellenbeer. He's into tech and he used to have a little tech um, magazine write up every month. He'll talk about tech. And he says, now keep in mind, he signed a $57 million contract in 2004. But even he said that when the new iPhone or when the new this and new that comes out, he'll wait six months. 
Now, this dude got $57 million. He can just go out and snap his finger and buy it. But even he practices good habits. He says, I'll wait six months for the new technology. Because instead of me spending $1,200 on this, it'll be about $400 when I buy it. So just simple things like that. The, the most important thing you can control, because you can't control what the market's going to do. You can't even control if you're going to keep your job tomorrow. You know, a lot of people working in January have lost their jobs. Their, their entire companies are gone. So you can't control that. But what you can control is savings. And also you can't control budget. And I, I've seen somebody mention budget earlier. Uh, John Sanchez yeah. mentioned, he said it's called a budget. So <laughs> you, So you can control your budget. And you can control savings, just like when you own a business. Greg owns a business. The most important thing he could do is, is cutting costs at every turn. If there's an opportunity to cut costs, then you, you pretty much made money. So that should be constantly what's on your mind, cutting costs and trying to save a little bit. You don't have to go down to bare zero. You know, Have some fun. Enjoy your life. But just do it responsibly. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, I think everybody needs to look at their own self as a business, right? Everybody has a balance sheet, right? Um, assets minus liability equals net worth. That's that's basic yeah. stuff. Um, I have a question. Have you, I just, I meant to answer it. Have you uh, read Think and Grow Rich times 20 yet? No, I have not. I actually... Um, great, book. great book. Yeah, I... Um, <laughs> the thing is that, you know, working in the investment industry, I had learned all this stuff on the job. Um, and through experience. So I really didn't feel the need to read a lot of books when I kind of knew from experience in terms of um, how to actually, you know, this stuff actually works. Um, yeah. But I have read, I have read some books, a um, uh, little book on, uh, I think Common Sense Investing uh, is one of them, Walk Down Wall Street, uh, that one, Jack Bogle. I read a lot of Jack Bogle uh, books, um, things of that nature that, you know, I think uh, just focusing on the basics. Um, now, I do want to talk a little bit about um, individual stocks and, and securities because, you know, you know, when I tell people about investing, you know, in the stock market and using mutual funds, I think a lot of people look at that as, as unsexy. Right. So we'll talk a little bit about some some sexy stuff, but it's not going to be get too sexy. It's going to be uh -huh. just sexy enough to where I feel like I'm comfortable telling people this type of stuff. Yeah. So we'll get down to, you know, obviously I told you guys about index funds, which follow the market, right? Index funds, you want to have them low cost, which means the expense ratio, you want the expense ratio to be below um, 1%, preferably really below 0.15%. Uh, you can get it down about one, uh, sorry, about 0.14%, even lower than that, 0.04% if you go with, you know, some really low cost uh, index funds. Generally speaking, that's what you want to do, especially if you don't know what you're doing. You just want to invest in the market as a whole, have your asset allocation based off stock to bond ratio. If you have a long uh, investment time horizon, so that means 10 years plus, most of your portfolio should be stocks. If it's sh shorter than that, then you need to be about, you know, 50 percent bonds. 50% uh, stocks, if you're looking to buy a house or something like that to avoid, you know, too much volatility, but still getting some growth. And you can expose yourself to the total U.S. stock market and you can do half of that, like, you know, half your stocks can be U.S. stocks and they can be international stocks. So you can do the total international stock market, right? Or you can do the total U.S. bond market and then you can do the uh, total international bond market or something like that. You can break it down something like that. Right. But just keep it as simple as possible. However, I know some of you guys, because of the, the crash um, that happened, people think that, you know, airlines, you know, and there's, you know, uh, entertainment and tourist and cruise stuff is big opportunities. And I'm not saying they're not big opportunities. But what I'm saying is you got to be careful because there's a lot of stuff that we don't know when it comes to these airlines and these cruise industries, because their rebound is going to depend a lot on what the government is doing. So yeah. if you want exposure to those companies and those industries, you can also index those industries by buying what we call ETFs that follow those industries, right? So you can buy an ETF that maybe just follows the airline industry, or yeah. you can buy ETFs that follow just technology or consumer goods, right? Yeah. So you can you can take a sector and buy an ETF, which trades like a stock. It's not a mutual fund. It trades like a stock. 
you can buy an ETF to get exposure to some of those um, industries and sectors that you guys think are going to be good and going to rebound. However, you don't want to expose yourself too much to it. You always want to be as diversified as you can. Never put all your eggs in one basket. I am not an advocate of putting all your money right. in individual stocks. I'm just not. But yeah. if you're going to put your money in individual stocks, I would suggest sticking with the good old Apple, Googles, Facebooks, Amazons of the world. And the reason why is because we know those companies are likely going to be around and they're going to be profitable for a long time. Because, again, yeah. you know, they're, they're guys who are paid millions of dollars a year to beat the market and they cannot do it. This has been studied. It is almost impossible to beat the market consistently over the long term. That's why you can be the best fund manager in the world as a normal person just following the market, just indexing. Yeah. You don't have to be too fancy. You don't have to you know, get into the weeds or anything like that. But if you're going to do that, then make sure that it's only a small part of your portfolio that's invested, that's invested in individual sectors or uh, individual um, stocks. And if you're going to invest in individual stocks, stay away from penny stocks. Try to invest in large cap stocks that are going to be around for a long time. Disney, you know, things like that that, have, that we know are going to be good in the long term. Yeah, and, you know, you talk about indexing. That is a good, safe way to invest. And also, if you want to get a little bit aggressive but not too aggressive, you can trade like the rich. Um, and I don't want to go too much on this. It's something you need to study, but they're called iron condors. And basically, with a particular stock or index, you collect money when you, as soon as you trade the stock, you collect money. So it's kind of like paying, it's, it's kind of like collecting rent on a condo. You know, you buy the stock and you collect rent every month. And people will pay you every single month these premiums. And so let's say that you have about $30,000 or $40,000. You can collect $500 to $1,000 consistently with very little risk. And so, um, so research iron condors. If you guys have about thirty, forty thousand that you can afford to invest, that would be the safest thing to invest because that's how the rich invest. You know, um, a lot of middle class they they buy options in which they try to you know turn a dollar option to five dollars, but that's very risky. Um, the best thing to to do is to get your um, to get your iron condor set up to where you can have thirty, forty thousand dollars and just collect five hundred to a thousand dollars with zero risk, and that money adds up. And if you compound that, that could be millions over about ten years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, there's all types of, like I said, different investment vehicles out there um, for people to take advantage of. And you know, again, I'm just I'm trying to dispel this myth that you know there's not opportunities and that there's not things that people can everyday people can take advantage of to build wealth um over time um so like i said we're just you know we're just tossing out ideas we're, we're letting you guys yeah. know that there's multiple things that that you can that you can do um to help uh increase your net worth over time and again i think to me personally i feel like taking advantage of the stock market and just being uh, conservative about the way you do things is the the best yeah. way to go um, because over time that's how you're going to build wealth um, in the safest manner now I guess I don't let's see do you think the president Trump will win around do you think I got a few questions okay yeah yeah I'm just uh, answering some questions do I think that you um do I think that President Trump will win a uh, re-election? Will the GOP keep the Senate and add seats? Will GOP win back the House? How bad will Melon Frodobot fraud be? All right. So do I think President Trump will win a re-election? Um, my gut feeling tells me that he will. I feel like at this point, it's in order for <laughs> I've heard this argument that in order for him to lose, the election got to be rigged, right? Because I, I feel like so many, so many people have seen What's going on in the streets um, in terms of Black Lives Matter, um, this obvious Marxist communist agenda that the Democrats have yeah. that have turned out, turned off a lot of people. And I feel like a lot of people are closet Trump supporters, even if they don't like Trump, they feel like they can't sign up for what the Democrats are selling us. Um, and I feel like a lot of people are like that. Um, and I feel like that's going to extend throughout the whole GOP. 
Um, I think that it, that that the, the I think the Senate is gonna stay stay stable. Um, and I, I think that the House is gonna stay stable. I think it's basically gonna be pretty. It's gonna stay stable in terms of kind of what we have um, right now. At least that's that's kind of what I'm hoping for. Um, I don't know how bad mail-in voter fraud will be. I, I really don't. Um, I but I don't like the fact that this is something that we're doing during this election. This is not the election to be relying on mail-in votes. It's 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 just not. It's gonna be too many of them. There's too much at stake. It's it's too yeah. polarized right now. And I think that mail-in voter uh, fraud. I mean, sorry, these mail-in ballots probably gonna be the worst idea if this election is close and it's decided by mail. It's going to be the worst yeah. idea in American history, in my opinion, because if the red mirage happens where President Trump is, you know, the winner on um, Tuesday night, election night, and then it comes back a week later that Biden is the winner because of mail in votes, this country is going to go to war. Small war, but war nonetheless. Yeah, That's it, my it opinion. It might be a civil war no matter who wins. <laughs> That's what it seems like. And also the worst thing that can happen, and it happened in 2000. When there was a so-called fuzzy math in the uh, voting, to where Al Al Gore won the election, they halted they halted the uh, um, the results for two whole months, and then something went wrong with in Florida, where I guess Florida was miscounted, and then all of a sudden George Bush was the president, and so it could be something like that, to where one person wins. Now there's a small percent chance this will happen because of technology, but you never know. One person could win. And then a few months later, they announced a new winner, which will set the world on fire. Back then, it wasn't a huge deal. But now, I mean, come on. You want to talk about a civil war? My God. If, yep. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's going to be interesting. This this is this is going to be the most hotly contested election ever and the most watched, the most followed. I mean, this is going to be extremely, extremely huge for this country. I just hope we make the right de the right decision, no matter who gets elected. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, Doctor e uh, Emily, I think that's her name. She had a comment that I think is pretty uh, interesting. Remember, you want a system that works for forty plus years. Exactly what I've been saying. It's much better to keep this very simple, which is what I've tried to do. Uh, yeah. do what Warren Buffett says, buy the index S&P 500 or total stock market, like I've been saying, and hold it forever. That's what yeah. you should do. Now, unless you're trying to use that money um, soon, then you're going to want to have more bonds and more stability and probably, you know, uh, take advantage of money markets and more short term securities, um, which I'm a fan of money markets, guys. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fan of money markets over uh, over CDs uh, just because they're more liquid. Um, that's just another piece of advice as well for you. Um, but yes, I, I, that's, that's essentially what I've been saying. How does the election affect the stock market? To keep it 100 with you guys, I think that if President Trump wins, I think we're going to see an initial, uh, sell off. And the reason why is because I think that if President Trump wins. Um, I think that it's not that investors won't be happy. Obviously we're going to be happy for lower taxes. However, I think that the, the ensuing protests and riots and outrage is going to, uh, cause an initial sell off. And then uh, once that kind of smooths over, I think we'll go back to business as usual. However, guys, the market is overvalued. Um, I'm just keeping it 100 with you. Um, it's been overvalued for a while, and we're 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 due for a serious correction at some point. Um, I don't know when, and people have been saying this since the Obama administration. So this is not a Trump administration thing. This is just. It's just overvalued um, at this point. Yeah. And the, the P.E. ratio is historically high. Um, and it's just one of those things where at some point um, price is going to catch up to the actual earnings. Um, and, and But we'll see in terms of how the election is going to affect it. Um, I think that if Trump wins, again, there will be an initial sell off. But I think that, you know, it will return back to business as usual. Um, however, if the Democrats win... I'm not sure what will happen because I think if the Democrats win, they're going to be more incentivized to go ahead and get this stimulus um, passed and to, and, to, and to get through. And I think that that pushing that stimulus through may help the market uh, stabilize and, and, and have less a little bit less volatility um, after the election. So I, I'm just saying and I'm saying that from the perspective of Nancy Pelosi right now is holding up the stimulus, guys. And we got to understand how politics works. And, you know, the market has been fluctuating based off of um, 
um, speculating based off what's going to happen with this stimulus. That's why a lot of people were making a lot of money um, when this crash initially happened and you see these huge, you know, volatility swings in the marketplace. That's because yeah. people were gambling based off what was going to happen with the stimulus, where they're going to build the airlines out, you know, where they're going to build the cruise lines out. People were gambling on that type of stuff. And that's how you saw a lot of people was making a ton of money during that time period. Um, yeah. However, if there is no stimulus, then eventually, guys, you got to understand, we're, you know, we were at one point, we we're at record high unemployment. And that's going to catch up to us over time. You know, there's there's a consumer goods company. I mean, there's uh, companies that are not consumer goods because they've been doing well because we've been buying more of that stuff to try to stay afloat. But um, there's certain companies out there that, you know, have been staples that haven't been doing well. You know, most of the what's holding up the stock market right now are tech companies. Right. The Facebooks, the Apples, the Amazons of the world. They're they're the, they're the stocks that are doing well. They're the companies that are doing well. But like I said, eventually, um, you know, real economics catches up to the stock market. And that's just my opinion on it. And we've been overvalued for a while. That's not a Trump administration yeah. thing. That's just a market thing, because after um, Obama had uh, bailed out the companies um, back in uh, <clears throat> back in 2008, a lot of companies uh, got a lot better at uh, keeping their balance sheets in check. So they were better at holding cash. They were more efficient in terms of how they ran their company. So that caused a lot of their valuations to go up as well um, because companies just literally just got better at, you know, handling their finances. And that's what happened. So yeah. I will say that companies have gotten better at um, waiting through times like this um, because of what happened in 2008. They kind of learned their lesson. And that's a, that has benefited us in terms of having some stability. But keep in mind, um, the Fed had lower interest rates to an all time low um, going into this COVID thing. And that's also what's kind of kept the market up as well. So eventually, at some point, they're going to have to raise interest rates back up again. Um, and like I said, it, it's not going to happen anytime soon, obviously, because we need to keep money into the economy and we need to keep um, investments into the economy and money needs to stay cheap for companies uh, to continue to borrow. But. Again, eventually it's going to slow down um, and we've had low interest rates for a while. And at some point it's going to it's going to have to go back up. So that's my opinion on that. Yeah, the market will uh, correct itself. And you mentioned the stock market being overvalued. So is the real estate market. I mean, it is ridiculous. Yeah. So if you guys own houses out there, be ready for that house value to drop about 30 percent. I, I hate to say it. And I'm looking at my own situation, too. But the housing market is about 30 percent inflated, especially in California where I'm at. And I'm sure it's nationwide, too. And also a lot a lot of the stocks now the indexes are sky high. The Nasdaq, the S&P, the Dow Jones, those are sky high. Those are way overvalued. However, individual stocks, most of them are actually at the value that they that they need to be. Um, you know, the average stock is about was about 70 to 80 dollars. Now that same stock is 40 to 50 because of COVID. Because what happened was in March, and I'm just going to say ABC stock for $70. That ABC stock was cruising at 70 all up until COVID. COVID had dropped to 20 because the index has dropped. The Dow Jones went from 29,000 to 18,000. But then that bounced back up. But your ABC stock that was at 70, it may be attached to your 401k, who knows? But that 70 stock bottomed out at 20, and many people were expecting it to go back to 70. But a lot of those stocks went from 70 to 20 to 30 to 35, and they stopped there. So that's bad if you invested in it, but it's good news if you just get into the market. Because you're getting a lot of these stocks for 50, 60, 70% off. So if you do want to invest, look for stocks that were that were huge, that made a big drop and never recovered especially if it's a good company, because a lot of times it will recover to somewhere where you can have stability or make a little money. So the market is going to correct itself, but a lot of individual stocks have already corrected themselves and they've just been flat. So um, if you are going to invest, make sure that you invest in something that um, that had a low, but at the same time has, has a chance to come back up to what it used to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my only addition to that would be, you know, make sure that, you know, you're limiting your exposure to it. Don't don't make too yeah. much of your your portfolio. Um, don't gamble too much on individual stocks. Um, I, yeah. I, like I said, I'm just I'm you know um, like I said, you definitely try to find some some deals. Um, you know, try to look at 
you know, some stocks that have not recovered quite yet, but, you know, look to recover um, and, and, and get some exposure to it. But, you know, make that a small part of what you do. Don't make that a big part yeah. of what you do because it's, it's, it's very risky and you, you want to invest for the long term. You want to invest for decades. Um, that's yeah. what you want to do. Yeah, banks, airlines, oil companies, um, you know, like restaurants, those are good things to maybe uh, take a look at because those are way down. Those are like at pandemic levels. And we're up, and it looks like we're going to get out of the pandemic, hopefully. They're talking about the second wave. Who knows? But, um, yeah, just look for something that's undervalued. And you can read a lot of different publications. They'll tell you whether a stock is undervalued or not. So make sure you find something that's undervalued and just invest long term. Or you can buy a long term option. Let's say that the stock is at forty dollars. You can buy an option for about eight hundred bucks. That you know it's going to mature by next year. You can buy like an April two thousand twenty one option. So if it goes up between now and April, you'll make a little bit off that. Um, one thing I want to touch on because uh, I know Ice Cube, he's caught a lot of heat from Donald Trump, and um, I want to talk about just how as black people we can we can help create wealth for us um, because this is our main problem. Um, in the black community, as far as uh, wealth, there's there's something called wealth circulation. And what happens is, as black people, we don't own a lot of things in our neighborhood. We don't own any sort of major sort of shipping or major um, overseas business. You know, we don't own any textile companies. We don't own any part of the borders to where shipping goes. A lot of that stuff is overseas. And so when it comes to wealth, we don't have any inherent wealth. All of our wealth com comes from our job or our talent. Let's say you play basketball, you know, you're a musician, something like that. So we don't own anything of value, um, you know, when it comes to a big scale. You know, we don't own any banks. Um, we don't own any, um, you know, things that, you know, deliver. We don't own any commerce. And so what we want to do is make sure our money circulates because I live in L.A., and I see this all the time. I drive through LA and you can drive toward downtown. You know, you'll see the Latinos, they'll have four corners of stuff that they're selling. It could be clothes, it could be shoes, it could be whatever. But you'll see four people selling the exact same thing, but they're all making money. You know, like if you go to a game, you'll see Four different hot dog stands. You know those delicious bacon hot dogs you guys like? The the bacon wrap hot dogs. You know what I'm talking about, Greg. <laughs> yeah, you'll, see, you'll, see, you'll see four different bacon hot dog stands, but they're not pissed off at each other. They're not like, hey, get off my corner. They're all making money. And this is why. Because let's say that each of those stands make 500 bucks each, right? Now, in the black community, that 500 is just 500 because our money goes to someone other than us. You know, we're giving it to the bank, we're giving it to the car payments, we're giving it to house payments, we're buying clothes. But Hispanics, they have their own banks, they have their own shopping, they have their own insurance companies, they have their own everything. So that money circulates. So that $500 is actually $10,000 that they make on a daily basis because it circles back. And this is, this is a wide example but let's say you get a Lopez family and they and they stamp their dollar bill with a heart. They'll they'll collect that money. They'll they'll buy something with that dollar bill stamped with a heart. Eventually, that that same dollar bill that, that was stamped with a heart, it will come right back to them in some form or it'll come to a family member. Their money circulates all the time because they're spending within their own community. Now, the thing about black people, we don't own anything. So we have to make sure that we take care of our personal finances first. And then once some time goes by, we'll have enough personal finances to get into a bigger business. So if you want, and you know, black folks, if you want to really help yourselves, reparations are not going to do it. Ice Cube <laughs> is prime, but he can't save black America by himself. It starts, it starts with you, savings. It starts with cutting costs in your home. It starts in investing. It starts with financial education, learn it and pass it down. That's how you create wealth. It starts with you on the individual level. And eventually once we all start doing this, like Greg said, you can get $3.7 million by the, about time you're 50. 1.3, 1.3. Yeah, 1.3. So if we have enough 1.3 million black folks in the next 10, 20 years, 
then we can start expanding that. We can start buying stuff in our neighborhood and in our county and in our state. So eventually we we are at a situation to where we can own our own, own our own banks, own our own um, you know, retail companies. But it all starts with the individual. That's why we're doing this show right now. People, save your money, cut costs. Do it on an individual basis. And I promise you, 10 to 20 years, it will grow. Yeah, that, that was good, Duran. That was good. You killed it. Yeah, <laughs> that was, yeah that was a good explanation. Um, I 100%, uh, I 100% agree with that. Um, you mentioned reparations, and I'm glad you brought that up. I'm, yeah. I get on the reparations, people. I can't stop getting on yeah. them because... No, tell me your opinion on reparations before I start talking about it. Reparations is a dream, folks. <laughs> reparations do not exist. You know what reparations is? Instead of getting that expensive iPhone, get you a used two-year-old phone from Amazon for a hundred bucks. That's where that's your reparations. That's nine hundred dollars you put in your pocket. Didn't have to work, didn't have to slave. You got nine hundred bills right there just by going to Amazon, get a two-year-old phone. Yeah, that that's that's your reparations. My 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 reparations. My answer was gonna be, you know what your reparations are? Reparations is that Roth IRA. That Roth yeah. IRA is your reparations. You put your money in, it's taxed. And then as your income grows and your money grows in your Roth IRA, when you get ready to take it out, it is tax free. OK. Yeah. Tax free. That is your reparations. <laughs> you have all the tools to get your own reparations. <laughs> Stop crying about it. Stop asking for it and go out there and figure out what can you do to make your money work for you and to stretch your money and to pay as little taxes as you can. That's what you should be doing. Yeah. Because the tools are out there. The, uh, everything is out there for you. What's available to the rich is available to you. Now, I mean, obviously, yeah. you're not you're not going to be able to get in some hedge funds and some private equity funds and some other more so sophisticated investments that have some offshore investments and things of that nature. You're not going to be able to do yeah. that. But the core basic principles that they use, you can use, and you have it available at, for you if all you got to do is use this thing called Google. And figure yep. out how to save your money, you know what? How to take it? How to take advantage of tax advantaged accounts? It's not yeah. hard, guys. You can look it up. Anybody can learn this stuff. But you got to get out of the mindset, in my opinion, of waiting for something that's not going to happen. It's, it's, it's not. It's not going to happen. And I wouldn't bank on it. Learn how yeah. to stretch your money and take advantage of the resources that the government has set up for you already to take advantage of. Like I think they just raised the contribution limit for IRAs. So again, you, that's you can, huge. yeah, that's huge. That's huge. That's more money that you can save every single year tax advantage. You can either have it tax deferred or you can pay the taxes on it now and not pay taxes on it later. Um, yeah. You have that option. It, it is what it is. And uh, one secret to um, having tax free dollars is actually opening up a corporation in your name. Because when you open up a corporation, now you don't have to get a brick and mortar building which may be illegal in two years, who knows, but you don't have to get a brick and mortar building. You can just put your name. I'm going to look up somebody's name, Alan Fillmore. He says, pay yourself first. That's true. But Alan Fillmore, he can put Alan Fillmore Incorporated. And what he can do is once he has an incorporation name, he can replace the social security number with a tax ID number. And you can use that tax ID number to buy property, to buy anything, to buy your car. And what that does is it can make you, your business. It can make you turn into a business. Alan Fillmore turned to a business. Jay Z said, "I'm not a businessman. I'm a business man." So what that means is, if you're a business, you can write off expenses, you can write off trips, you can write off food, you can write off cell phone bills. As long as you have a corporation in your name, once you get that EIN attached to your name, even if you don't start a business but you just put Alan Fillmore Inc., then you can um, you know, be pretty much tax-free in certain areas. So if you take a vacation or if, and you have to and talk to a paralegal or talk to a, um, a, uh, an accountant about this, just see how to set it up, but do it. You know, don't go to LegalZoom, talk to an accountant, spend the 300 bucks, talk to an accountant, because it could save you thousands upon thousands over the years. But once you get an EIN, 
you can write off pretty much anything. The government allows for that because rich people do it all the time. Very few rich people pay any taxes. People are talking about, you know, Donald Trump paying 750 bucks. How would you like to pay 750 bucks every year in taxes? You can do it. Same thing he did. You can do the exact same thing. So if you get an EIN, that will pave the way for you to get a lot of tax-free dollars in your own household. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 I 100% agree with that. Um, and, you know, I, I just think that it's one of those things where people just have to do more time learning about how to beat the system rather than worrying about how the system is beating you. Yes. Right. And I think that that's the problem is we, we spend too much time reading about what <laughs> other people have done bad to us and, you know, things of that nature, rather than figuring out, OK, how can I, you know, beat it? How can I overcome it? You know, what tools yeah. are out there to help me uh, grow my money and to grow my wealth? And, and that's what we really need to be focused on. Uh, moving forward is just, you know, what are the positive things? We all need to come together, share knowledge with each other and 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 move forward. And and again, that to me is the best and most practical form of reparations that they are. And I want to I want to uh, address uh, Ronald Marshall here because he's very he looks to be very adamant about uh, reparations in the chat. Talking about reparations. Yeah. Now, I've never I've never heard a practical argument. For reparations i've never heard it i've never heard one because none of these people can identify who was actually a descendant of a slave and who were descendants of slave owners now yeah. they can't identify it and they also can't answer the questions of okay well if you are you know, half a slave or if you're, you're, you're half white and, you know, your other side of family is black and, you know, your other side was half a descendant of slave and one side wasn't, then, you know, do you get half the reparations? If you are fourth, right, or fourth of your family was, you know, descendant of slave, do you get fourth, a fourth of it? You know, how do you track it? Um, how does it work from a practical standpoint? Um, and people always want to talk about the Jews and the Japanese. And it's like, well, in that in that nature, there's multiple reasons why the Jews got reparations. I'm not going to go into some of it because I'm on YouTube, but one of the main reasons is because, you know, that the practical nature of being able to track who was affected by the Holocaust was there. They did it right after World War II, so you could track yeah. who was actually affected. If you ask me during um, Reconstruction, should black people get reparations? I would be wholeheartedly yes, absolutely. However, unfortunately, we were broke. <laughs> and 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 rep and it just didn't happen. But 150 years removed, I really feel like people have to stop leaning on the past and to start to think about what can we do in 2020 in the future. Because you know you have technology at your hands. You have the library of information on the internet where you can literally Google anything that you want to know. You can learn anything that you want to learn. You can learn any skills that you want to learn. And to me, that is the best form of reparations because you can teach yourself how to fish rather than have somebody fish for you. And I think that long term, that's going to create more wealth for you at an individual level than the government giving you a handout and then not knowing yeah. what to do with it and thinking yeah, that it's going to make things right. It, it, I don't yeah. think it's necessarily going to make things right. And I don't think it's necessarily going to last long because a lot of that money is going to go back to Gucci and, you know, Lamborghini and, and Prada and, you know, the jewelry store, the Arab man selling the jewelry. <laughs> you know, that's who it's going to go to. So, you know, I don't know. That's just my opinion on it. Um, I just, the reparations people just really, really kind of hit a nerve with me because I, I just feel like there's so many tools out there that you can take advantage of. Like, I just feel like just a Roth IRA is just, that's reparations in and of itself. Like, come on, man. Like, you put money in and you don't have to pay taxes on it and you can get growth for 30, 40 years. Like, no capital gains, no nothing. Like, I don't understand, yeah. like, what, I mean, that, that's things out there that's available. So that's just my opinion on it. And sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of ranting, but I just, it just really annoys me. It really does. Well, some people need to hear this because um, we, we have been victimized people, but we are not victims. You cannot have the victim mentality because what the victim mentality does, it takes away personal responsibility. Personal responsibility is the most important asset that you have. 
And that's what a lot of Democrats try to take away from you. It's not your fault you're like this. It's not your fault you're, you know, you have this amount of resources or you have this many people in jail. It's not your fault. You cannot take personal responsibility away from someone. Once you take away personal responsibility and accountability, you rob that person of their soul, in my opinion. The rules are set. Black people have to work twice as hard to get half the credit, to get half the prestige, to get half the positions, to get half the money. The rules are set. Either jump in a fast lane and run your ass off or stop running, but do not blame the white man for you working the same amount of hours as a white guy and expecting the same result. It's not going to happen. If the white guy's busting his ass for six hours, you got to bust your ass for 12. Those are the rules. And once you have that mindset, you'll go a lot further than wanting, wanting the government to fix something that they created. The government created this. And then we help exacerbate it with the victim mentality. So once you get rid of the victim mentality and focus on growth and focus on it's not going to be the government that saves me, but the people in my household, in my neighborhood, in my city, then that's where you can truly grow and free yourself from victim mentality. Now, we should probably have a part two because I'm going to mention one word and we may go for <laughs> the hours. I'm going to say one word, credit. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm gonna speak. I'm just gonna go in a little bit of credit rant, and I'll and I'll let you guys. Let me comment you know, on what you just said before you go into credit. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I feel like no matter how you feel about systemic racism, um, I, I think uh, Dorian, like I said, definitely touched on that. For me personally, I feel like regardless of whether you believe in it or not, we spend too much time talking about it, um, rather than doing what at the end of the day, what I feel like you have to do regardless of whether it exists or not. You should always be working harder than the next person. If yeah. one person at your job, whether they're black, white, Hispanic, Asian, whatever, if they're putting in the hours, you better put in another hour. You know, if yeah. they, you know, if they're working a certain level, if they're, you know, uh, kissing up to their boss a certain amount, you better be kissing up a little bit more. You know what I'm saying? That's just competition, and that's how capitalism works, regardless of whether you're black or white or or whatever, right? And I'm just I'm just saying this from the standpoint of. Whether or not you believe in systemic racism or not, the answer for you as an individual is always the same. Work harder than the next guy. That's it. That's that's always yeah. the answer. It doesn't matter if it's if it's systemically racist, whether you got a disadvantage. Always work harder. That that's it. That's it. Now you can go into credit. Yeah, yeah, work harder. I mean, everything has a simple solution. Like he said, if you want to make money, work harder. You want to lose weight, diet and exercise. No fat. <laughs> No keto, nope. Just just walk, just sweat, and cut down on the carbs. That's it. That, that's, that's no magic formula. And um, and one thing about credit, write this down. All you guys, Ronald Marshall, Sheev, uh, Palpatine, Trojan Optimus, Mommy Harris, KD twenty twenty. Write this down. Only use credit for investments. That is it. Because investments grow. So, because how much are credit card um, interest rates? About 20%. Let's say the 20%. Yeah, yeah. is 30. It eats you, bro. But, let, but let, let's say you got the 0% for a year, the 7%, whatever. But let's say it's an average of 20% per year. If you're making 15 to 20% a month and you're using 20% a year credit, then you can build with credit. Let's say you have 30000 in credit. You buy a piece of property. That piece of property is giving you, let's say, 100% a year. You put in 20000 on this property, you're getting 20000 a year. It's 100%. But you're only paying about 800 bucks a year in that 20000 That's how you use credit to build. You pay 800 to Visa, and then you collect 20000 from your investments. That's how you use credit. You don't use credit to shop. You don't use credit to buy TVs and to buy shoes and vacations. You know why they call it rewards? You know why they reward you for spending like that? Because you're being ignorant with the, with the money. They, they, <laughs> they, they give you points of rewards for being ignorant with your money. It's not being stupid. It's not being dumb. I mean, you know, Because if you have $2 in your pocket, but you got a credit card, you can go on a shopping spree. Who wouldn't? I did. I got $15,000 in credit without applying when I got my loan officer job. I had a loan officer job. I made about $10,000 in about two months, which was a lot of money back then. 
the first thing they sent me after I opened my bank account with all this money was two credit cards, one for $8,000, one for $7,000. I need an application. I have to call them. They just say, here's your credit card. Call this number, and it's activated. So guess what I did? Went shopping, took my girlfriend out. I had $3,000 worth of bills, and I'm like, oh, where the hell did this come from? Now, if I would have taken that fifteen, twenty thousand and invested in property, and I was in Ohio, properties were about twenty-five thousand. I could have put five thousand down on property and flipped it. I would have been a millionaire by twenty-eight years old had I known what I'm what I'm telling you now. Use your credit only for investments. Now, if you make a ton of money or a decent amount, you can strategically buy things with credit and pay it off. That way you get rewards points because eventually you have a bunch of rewards points. After three years, you can pretty much live off rewards points. A lot of rich guys do that. They never pay for anything. They don't pay for flights. They don't pay for dinners. It's all comped. So you can do that if you got a ton of money. But if you have a decent job, make between 30, 40, 50,000. Use your credit for investments. If you, don't, if you don't know how to invest, keep those credit cards parked. Keep them in a lockbox. Do not touch them unless you want to invest. Again, you're going to pay about 20% interest. So you want to take that 20% interest that you're paying and collect 200% interest, 50%, 1,000% on your investments. So again, if you're paying, if you're paying Visa 800 bucks a year, and you're making 20 grand a year, kudos. You're using credit the right way. Yeah, I agree. Um, I'll, <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely paying off credit cards. Um, you know, it's okay to use credit for business because the interest rate uh, for business is going to be uh, a lot lower than it is for personal expenses. So, like I said, like he said, you know, use it for something that is going to be investment. Um, so, like I said, business credit is good. Um, however, like I said, for personal expenses, stuff like that, you want to keep that as low as possible. Um, and if you do have it, you know, a lot of uh, personal debt, you got to pay it off before you can start doing anything really to be quite honest with you, because every single month, if you let that, you know, that interest, uh, that money build up, that balance build up, that interest build up, uh, essentially it's costing you money. And really you are paying yourself when you pay back, um, uh, pay off your credit card because you're avoiding paying more interest payments. So you're really paying yourself when you pay off um, credit, um, credit card debt. So it, I think that's that's super important. Um, and I'm glad you brought that up, that we went into that. Yeah, and see the thing about credit, I'll be honest, the credit industry is a scam because this is what happens. You guys have to be careful about this. They don't care how much money you spend on credit. All they care about is the debt ratio on the credit. Example, if you have a $5,000 credit card and you pay 500 bucks on that credit card, that's fine. You, you, can, you can spend 2,000 on that credit card. It's fine because your limit is 5,000. So if you spend 2,000 on that, you're at a 40%, which is not bad. However, if you have a $300 limit and you spend 250, they can knock 70 points off your credit that next month. A lot of people don't know that. So you don't want to overuse any credit. If you have to move some credit over to something, do that. But make sure that you have control over your credit. Don't let your teenager go out and have your small credit card and go to the movies or spend a bunch of money on it. If you're going to give your teenager a credit card, make sure there's enough that they're going to spend to where the ratio will be off. You have to keep it. Write this number down. It has to be 30% or less. So if your limit is 1,000, do not put more than 300 on that because if it goes above that, now you're going into excessive debt territory. And what they'll do is, if let's say it's the 17th of the month, and you have a thousand dollar credit card, you spend eight hundred. On the first, your credit score will drop from seven fifty to about six seventy, just like that. But if you have a ten thousand dollar credit card, put eight hundred on it, then fine. So make sure that it's strategic. Make sure you have all the ratios under thirty. Even if you have to move them around, make sure that all your debt ratios are under thirty, and that way your credit score, if it's seven fifty, eight hundred, it will stay that way. Yeah, that's good advice, Duran. I didn't know you was uh such a big expert on uh on credit. 
Yeah, um, it, it kind of went hand in hand with being a loan officer because you you have as a loan officer you you have your fishermen and then you have like your hunters. You know, your fishermen just sit there and they'll you know wait for a client who has like pristine credit and just wants to save a little money in their mortgage. But then you have people with terrible credit. You have people with bankruptcies and all that stuff. And so I would I would you know make a little money off of the people with great credit, but everybody wants those people. They have 15 brokers calling them every day. So even if you're a great broker, they may cancel you because another guy was smoother than you. But if you find people with problems and you can solve that problem, then it made you more money in the long run. So I'll get a guy with a BK. I'll get a guy with a foreclosure. I'll get a guy with excessive debt. And I'll, I will help him fix this credit. And I learned how to fix credit on the fly. So once I help this guy go from a 500 to a 650, 700, and he can get a deal, he can turn his $4,000 debt into 1200 bucks a month with a consolidation. He loves me. It's not all about um, trying to find the best deal. It's like, hey, man, you rescued me from credit hell to now I have pristine credit. I can save money to feed my family. I can get an extra $2,000 per month in my household. You are my best friend. And so I got a lot of customers for life because of that. And so I had to learn how to fix credit on the fly because those were my best customers. I had to wait six months or a year. I had to plant those seeds. But once they start coming in, they never left me because I helped them fix their credit. And then at that point, we were buddies after that. So it wasn't just a transaction. It was like a friend helping me. And so I just learned credit by osmosis. Yeah, yeah. I feel like that's that's just kind of how it is when you're working in the financial services industry. When, you know, like, for example, with me working with, you know, uh, investments and securities and, you know, you working with, you know, loans and credit and things of that nature, you just you just kind of learn as it goes. And I think what you realize is that none of this stuff is hard. Right. Like yeah. none of this stuff is, is difficult. It's just that um, I think we don't do a good job of teaching this stuff in schools. Um, yeah. I, I think it's a shame that we don't have financial literacy classes in every single uh, public school where we're teaching, yes. you know, people about credit. Uh, coming out of school and, and investments and IRAs and, you know, 401ks and, and things of that nature, because these things are important when you get older. And, and the younger you start, the, the younger you understand this, the better off you're going to be when you're 60, 70 years old. You know, there's a lot of people that are just living off Social Security that, you know, are struggling. Um, and, yeah. and you shouldn't be dependent on Social Security. You got to depend on yourself to be able to take care of yourself in retirement. And a lot of people just put it off. They don't think about it. They don't, you know, uh, take it seriously. Um, you know, they go into college, they get into a lot of credit card debt and it weighs them down for the rest of their lives. Um, yes. and, and I think that is is really important uh, to have these conversations and to also, um, you know, teach this stuff and pass this information on. And, and that's why, um, you know, I wanted to have this live stream. I was excited to do it with you because I feel like I have this knowledge that I don't really get to talk about too much because of the nature of, my YouTube channel is more political yeah. more than anything, but I think it is important to, um, you know, take some time to take, take some time away to really talk about things. I feel like are, are more, you know, uh, immediately pressing in people's lives, um, such yeah. as, you know, fi investments and credit and, and debt and things of that nature, because that's, what's really holding us down. Right. I mean, generally speaking with me, you know, I look at it like this, you know, Democrat or Republican, I want to just pay less taxes and keep as much money as I can. Right. Democrat or Republican. And that's yeah. just what my thing is. So, you know, um, regardless of that, you know, I just think that it's important to just understand that you are your own business and that you have your own balance sheet and you need to know how to uh, manage that. You know, assets minus liability equals net worth. And if everybody understands that, um, you know, they will be a lot better off financially and personally. And they wouldn't be super so too caught up in, in the political stuff. Yeah. And the best gift you can give your kids, the best gift is financial literacy. Because, again, I have to repeat this. It breaks my heart every time I say it. But if I would have known about credit and how to use it, if somebody would have told me to take your $15,000 and get you a $5,000 down payment on some property and flip it, if they would have told me to do that repeatedly, I would have been a millionaire by age 28 it would have happened easily just that one little nugget of information it's a black man by the way 
Yeah. This, this is a black man, by the way. He's telling you at 28, he would have been a millionaire. So yeah. all that government oppression, even with all that government oppression, yeah. it's possible. Yeah. Oh, and, uh, you know, my background, I'm from Los Angeles. I'm from South Central L.A. I was born at Killer King Hospital, Martin Luther King Hospital in Wilmington, California. They call it Killer King. That's where I was born, raised in South Central. Um, and this was the 80s. And so you had teen pregnancy. You had crack cocaine. You had Crips, Bloods, Reaganomics. You had every sort of issue that was against us. Now, thankfully, it's better now. It's it's not great out there, but it's a lot better. I mean, I remember, you know, my family, it was like eight of us in the house and very little money, very little food sometime. And, um, you know, my family moved to Riverside County where they lived in trailers and stuff. And, you know, now everybody got a nice apartment. The little kids got cell phones and iPads like our generation has gotten better. You know, we started from nothing. Now this generation is doing a lot better. A lot of successful people that were poor in the 80s and 90s got a little something now. Now their kids have something. My kids eat, had more McDonald's in the past four years than I had my entire childhood. My kids are crazy spoiled. My kids, my kids won't eat pizza unless I con them with some candy at the end. That's how spoiled my kids are. I got, I got pizza once or twice every year. They get it every week. And I'm glad I'm able to spoil my kids. I'm glad that they're able to have nice things, that they can have a future. They can have college set up before the, before the age of seven. And so it all starts with you, though. You have to make a decision. Do you want to use the ills of the world as an excuse and to stop uh, trying to compete? Or do you want to hunker down, use the resources you do have? And your best resource, again, is personal responsibility, knowing that, yes, these things are against me. But if I make the decision to change this, it can change over time. It's not going to happen right away. You may not be able to write a check and go to college from your parents. You may have to get a scholarship. You may have to you know, do all-nighters and studying some courses, but it will pay off in the end. So as long as those resources, the technology, the time, as long as that's available to you, use it to the max. Yeah, we got a question in the Super Chat. Um, okay, guys, yeah. I got a question. So I recently just fixed my credit from 550 to 750. Congratulations. Uh, not trying to down people, but I could save 4k a month. That's awesome. Uh, would you start flipping and rentals? I follow, uh, bigger pockets. Uh, I'll get my take on that first. Uh, my take is this. Yeah, man. If, if you want to start, if that's what you want to do, um, you want to go into real estate, go into it. But like I said, I would say, do your research first. Um, understand, you know, um, you know, where the value's at and, you know, how to increase the value, um, of, you know, whatever property you decide to invest in, in terms of what's good in your local area, your city. Um, but for me personally, I would, I would, I would try to diversify your, my, your portfolio as much as possible. I, I would not discount the seven to 10% that you're going to get from the stock market and diversify mutual funds. You want to have a portion of that in the stock market, no matter what. And then if you want to go into real estate and, 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 and be a little bit more hands-on, you can do that as well. That's what I would do if I was you. However, like I said, Doran may have a, a different exam, a different uh, opinion, or he may agree, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, that, that's great. I was going to say exact same thing, but let me let me crack my knuckles on this. I, I might drop an f bomb. I'm sorry, but Mr. Poor Man Printing, good for you. First of all, I mean he's fixed his credit. Uh, he can save four grand a month. That's great, and you're in a you're in a great position to to do a lot of good. Now, one thing I want to tell you: stay the away from seminars do not go to these real estate seminars these oh you can make a million dollars in three months just come and call this number and come out to our hotel do not do that these people are fly by night they'll come to your city hype you up and then you'll spend 25 30 thousand you'll call on the phone like hey so how do i invest um i have no idea now, they won't say that, but basically they'll say a bunch of mumbo jumbo that doesn't help. They'll give you all these tools, all this stuff. But if you're not a business person, you won't survive in that accelerated type course situation because 
they expect, and this is a scam, of course, you know, making people who are not business people, you know, spend 40, 50,000 and they'll never make it in real estate. You know, most of these people, even if they have money, they'll never make it because I don't want to spend too much time on this, but you have business people and you have workers. They'll bring a bunch of workers into this seminar, make them pay all this money and expect them to be businessmen. You have to be a business person when you do real estate, when you're into that stuff. They're not business people. And what I mean by business person, the main thing that makes you a business person is if you work on commission or have experience in working on commission to where if a person says, no, you don't get paid. The husband loves your idea, but the wife doesn't like it, you don't get paid. So what happens is these engineers or these teachers or sometimes these paralegals, they'll come into this class, they'll spend this money and then they'll go out into the real world. They'll have this great real estate deal. Oh, I, I uh, put this $100,000 property on the contract. It can sell for 170, come and buy for me. You know, a person says, okay, I'll buy from you. And then they'll pull out at the last minute. Like, what happened? You're going to make $30,000. Why did you pull out? And they're done because they've never experienced business. They've never been rejected. They can understand why somebody will blow up a deal that's going to make them $40,000. But that's business. Business is stupid sometimes. You have to be able to, to uh, handle that. And a lot of new investors, a lot of people who are teachers trying to be investors, they can't handle that. So my advice to you. Stay away from seminars. What you want to do, Mr. Poor Man Printing, is to go to a local real estate chapter in your city because they'll talk about real estate specific to your city because these big fly-by-night companies are national. They don't know what's going on in your city, in your state, in your county. They have no idea. But the local real estate chapter, they do. And look online. Look at the nearest real estate meeting. They may have it on Zoom, but go to that. And then you have to have patience, poor man printing, but spend about six months with an investor. Help him out on deals. He'll walk you through everything. Work for free. Yes, you help him make $50,000. So what? That's his money, but you got some knowledge. So once those six months are over, you help this investor from start to finish close a few deals. Now you have the knowledge. Now you have firsthand knowledge. So now you can take your 40, 50, 100,000 and you'll be more educated in how to invest it. Yeah, I agree with that. Wow, Duran, you dropping some uh some some knowledge here. Um, see, you guys, you guys are getting a lot of value from this live stream. <laughs> I feel like you had to pay, you know, one, two grand, three grand for the for the knowledge that we dropping here right now. But wait, wait, they didn't pay for this? No, I'm they didn't gone. pay for this. No, they what, didn't pay for this. But <laughs> but you know, me personally, man, like. I'm not a believer in paying for knowledge. That's why I like, I, I feel like it's incumbent on, upon me to share what I know because, and for, you know, anybody share what you know, because at the end of the day, like you should not have to pay for things that are free, things that you can Google. And, um, you know, if you just want to know, you can look it up. Um, you can ask somebody and, and share knowledge. Um, you shouldn't have to pay for that because you, you're essentially putting yourself behind the eight ball, trying to get above the eight ball. And I, I really don't believe in that. Um, one question that I think is interesting, how can I invest 200K cash? Like Dr. Uh, Emily been saying and what I've been saying. Total, I mean, uh, index funds, man. Stock market, index funds. If you don't know what you're doing, if you don't know what you're doing and you just want to do something that works, that's based off the 100-year history of the stock market, you're going to get a long-term return. If you have a long time horizon and you have cash sitting around, stock market, the broad diversified mutual funds, an easy one, total stock market. You get access to the whole market, or you can do the S and P 500. You can follow that. And like I said, it's just if you have a long time horizon and your risk tolerance is high, um, that means that you don't care about the short term fluctuations. Again, total stock market, uh, S and P 500. You know, you can put 90 percent of that in that. Maybe you can put 10 or 20 percent of it in, in uh, the total bond market, um, or maybe even like something like, you know, a, a medium term, maybe a long term bond fund or something like that. If you have higher risk tolerance, try to get, you know, um, more interest payments or whatever, you can do that. But that's what you should stick with, in my opinion, if you're a beginner. And, and guys, it sounds simple. It's boring. But that's what that's what people do. I've seen people that have 
50 to 100 million dollar portfolios and 80 to 90 percent of it is mutual funds guys and and people want to you know you know say oh that's boring you know that's not get rich quick guys that's how it's done right like you 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 build wealth over time nobody get gets rich quick and these are solid investment principles that um we've studied for a long time we know this the av you have fund managers and i cannot stress this enough you have fund managers we're talking about hedge fund managers we're talking about the, the bill ackmans of the world the, the uh the carlisles of the world you know those guys it's been proven they can't beat the market over the long term they can't do it so as the average person you can get a leg up on even the best fund managers in the world most of them 90 percent of them by just being indexed just following yeah. the market and if you do that it's totally accessible to you guys you know if you you know get into mutual funds you can what they call dollar cost average that means that you just put a certain amount in every single month over a set period of time and you just do it forever and you you just keep doing it over your investment time horizon and you just let it sit and it doesn't matter if it's super high it doesn't matter if it's super low you're not trying to time the market all you're doing is just riding the wave and if you just yeah. ride the wave you just ride the wave that's the easiest simplest way to build wealth without having to think about it without having to read any balance sheets income statements statement of cash flows without having to do any of that you can be just as yeah. good as most fund managers who get paid millions of dollars this is an open secret but they don't tell you that and another thing too watch out what i'm talking about are passive uh index funds that means they just follow the market there are also funds mutual funds called active funds that have these fund managers that i was talking about that are managing these funds which means that they're picking stocks these stocks cannot outperform it's been proven they cannot outperform index funds over the long term because the expense ratio on actively managed funds is higher. So you're going to be paying one to two percent to get a, some guy in a suit to pick stocks for you. And they can't beat the market after you uh, adjust for the expense associated with having them manage your portfolio. That's another thing as well, too. That's just investing in a mutual fund. I'm going to talk a little bit about financial advice, finding a financial advisor guys because this we we almost have this down to a science you can basically figure this stuff out yourself one especially when you're young it's, it's not complicated now you do need if you have you know five ten million dollars even above a million dollars you probably do need a, a financial advisor but you don't need a fancy guy that's promising you the world that's not what you need and most a lot of people just need a, you can have a robo advisor they'll tell you what to do now, once you start really getting into having like, you know, an estate and trust administration, yes, you're going to need and you have like multiple businesses, LLCs, things of that nature. When you have a, a real estate, yeah, you're going to need, you know, a, 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 a financial advisor that you're going to have to pay some money for. However, you want to keep the cost of financial advice low as well. Right. So you don't want to pay any more than one percent. If you're paying one percent for somebody to manage your portfolio, you're getting ripped off. You're getting yeah. ripped off. Um, big, time. big time you can you can go to a company like vanguard and they will manage your your funds mm -hmm. your money for 0.3 percent yep. and 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 again you're going to save a lot of money over time versus paying one percent because a lot of those guys that you're paying one percent to you're paying one percent to them and then they're putting you in fancy mutual funds that are costing another one to two percent so by the time you even get up and running you're behind three percent when you yeah. could have just been indexed and you would have been above, you know what I'm saying? You would have been, you would have been up way ahead of them, right? And you would have saved a lot of money. So that's something else that a lot of people don't know. People are overpaying for advice. Don't overpay for advice. You can get a robo advisor, or you can go to one of these big mutual fund companies like Vanguard, Fidelity. You know, um, I don't like T. Rowe Price because that super actively managed. I don't like them. But you know, you can go to one of these big brokerage houses and get an advisor for cheap. They're just as good as these fancy guys in suits that's calling you, trying to sell you the world. They can't beat the market, guys. They can't do it. Yeah, let me explain 1% to you guys. I know you're listening on the surface like 1%? No, that's not that much. Let me tell you something. And I'm going to go back to the 1.3 million that Greg Foreman talked about. And I love it. The, the 1.3 million. Regular job, millionaire. About time you're 57. 
one percent it's compounded so if you're making three to four percent a year and paying one percent compounded let's say you do make 1.3 million you would have paid upward of 500,000 in fees that one percent two percent three percent sounds like a little bit but out of that 1.3 million you're giving over 500,000 to that advisor out of that so he's right make sure that you get a robo advisor or just um an index because simple indexes it's like a, a fraction of a percent maybe point zero you know point three point one five yeah. i've seen as low as what you know something like that some of them are zero so that, zero expense ratios yeah. fidelity has zero expense yeah. ratio mutual funds free <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, yeah a, lot of, a lot of low cost ways to do this guys but yeah i just want to touch on that one percent that one percent is massive over time it, it could be hundreds of thousands of dollars you you do not want to give that away if you don't have to yeah yeah i agree with that um one thing i want to touch over um two questions uh can we talk about uh 401k yes mommy harry what what questions do you have about 401k I mean, cause it, I mean, 401ks are a, a, a simple, right? Like you have certain rules based off your company, your company plan sets the rules and about what you can contribute and what it's going to match. Uh, generally, what you want to know about 401ks is you want to know how much money you can contribute and then you want to know how much they're going to match. Um, your company's going to match because everything that you contribute and they match, that's free money. That's literally, you want to talk about reparations? You want to talk about free money? 401k, matching, matching 401k. If, if you can get everything you contribute, your company matches up to a certain uh, percent, that is free money. You want to max that out if you can. And if people want to talk about reparations, there's your free money right there from your company. And then I want to talk right about there. real quick. Um, I'm going to let you chime in. I just want to make sure I get this. Should I let my 401k ride from a job I was let go from this year or do something else with it? So there's multiple options you can do with your 401k once you leave a job. You can roll it over into an IRA if you want. Or you can let it sit. Now, letting it, it it basically depends on you. If you roll it over into an IRA, you're going to be able to contribute to it again. You'll have all your money in one place. And honestly, maybe you'll pay less money for management. Let's say if you got your 401k at T. Rowe Price or someplace like that, that's, that's going to cost you a lot of money um, for them to just to manage it and to hold it. You paying fees. You roll it over to a place like Vanguard where there's basically no fees. You can save money on your 401k instantly right there, just rolling it over. Um, but essentially all you need, like I said, well, if I was you, I would roll it over into your current 401k, which is called a direct rollover. So that's what you should do. If you roll over your 401k guys, there's two things. You can do a direct rollover. You can do an indirect rollover, do a direct rollover whenever you can. A direct rollover means that the money does not go to you. The money goes to the, the company that is going to hold your money. And I'm telling you to do this because indirect rollovers are a taxable event. And that means that if you do an indirect rollover and that check comes to you, you have 90 days to get that check back into a qualified retirement account um, before it becomes a permanent taxable event and then you're gonna owe uh, income taxes on that money. So you wanna make sure you do a direct rollover whenever you can. Sometimes you may not have the option, but you can roll it over into a traditional IRA and then you can start to uh, you can either roll it over into uh, your current 401k or you can roll over into a traditional IRA and you can manage that yourself um, in which uh, you be subject to the same contribution rules and you could just let it ride from there. So I would say the yeah. only difference is, is that with uh, IRAs versus a 401k IRAs, generally you have more options in terms of what you can invest in. So for example, some companies just might not let you invest in individual stocks in your 401k. They might not have what they call a brokerage option. It may only have uh, mutual funds in your 401k. But with your IRA, obviously you're gonna have a brokerage option for your IRA. So that means if you wanna put some of your money in individual stocks, you want more control of it, um, IRA is gonna be um, the way to go. So it, it just depends on what you wanna do. Now, one other thing I wanna say about 401k, Guys, make sure your money's not sitting in the money market. Please, guys. When you got your 401k, that's long-term retirement. Unless you're getting ready to literally retire, don't have your money sitting in the money market or, you know, a bunch of bond or bond funds or things of that nature where most of your portfolio is not doing anything. And I've seen that way too many times where people will show me their 401k and their money is sitting in the money market. It's not doing anything in the money market, guys. 
Um, so make sure your money is actually invested in your 401k. And I know a lot of times when people get their sheet about their 401k, what do you want to invest in? They're given the options of do you want to be aggressive, semi-aggressive, you know, if you're young, when you're starting out, if you're 20, you want to be as aggressive as possible, <laughs> you know? Yeah. You want to have yeah. whatever that aggressive option is, that's what you want to do. Now, if you're older, you're getting into your 50s, your 60s, you want to be more moderate, you want to be more conservative because you're you're going to need the money soon. You're about to retire. That's generally how it works. Um, so, yeah, that's that's my advice on the, on the rollovers. Yeah. And, you know, just to add to that, again, if you are – if you have your money in a company, let's say like you work for a bank or whatever company, and that company's stock is at a certain point, you want to put long-term put options on that. It's just insurance. That's all it is, just in case of a crash. And so if your company stocks at $100, you want to get put options. And you can read to what put options are, but you want to get put options at about 90 bucks. 80 bucks, 70, whatever that is. And you can get them for about a year and a half. You can get a put option for, let's say, October 2021 or something like that. And you want to renew that every time it expires because you'll pay out some money for a few years. But if that thing crashes, if it crashes, you'll get a payout as opposed to your 401k getting ripped in half. And, you know, my girl's mother, it happened to her back in 2008. She had a 401k of about 300,000. Once the company stock dropped, it dropped from 300,000 to 75,000, then back up to 150, and she lost 150,000. Had she had put options on just a few put options, that 300,000 would have grown to 350 during the crash. So while everybody's going crazy, people jump out of windows and stuff like that, she would have made money during the crash. So it's not something where you're trying to get rich. All it is is just protection. So if you buy that new Rolls Royce, make sure you got some hellified insurance in that thing. You want to make sure you insure your 401ks and your stocks. Put options. That's the way to do it in case it crashes. If it goes up, good for you. But if it, if it crashes, then have those put options ready to pay you out. And let's say it does crash. You get, you get call options the opposite way. So let's say that the stock went from 100 to 50 to 100. You can get paid twice. It goes from 100 to 50, you get a payout. And then when it goes back up from 50 to 100, you get another payout. So it's not, it's not something to try to build wealth or get rich. It's just a protection. So guys, protect your 401ks the best you can. Talk to your bosses, talk to an advisor. But get put options against your 401k. It will save you a ton of a ton of headache and a ton of dough in the future in case there's a crash. Yeah, a put option, guys, is just an option to it's a contract where basically you have the option to sell at a certain price. Um, yeah. So that that's all it is. And, and, and um, a, um, a call option is, is a contract, an option to buy at a certain price yeah. that, that's that's all it is so a put option if if you have the option to essentially sell at you know um 90 if the market goes down to 60 or whatever then yeah. essentially you can buy at 60 and sell at 90 even though it's actually trading at 60 that's all it is um yeah 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 in a nutshell you know like you said 90 dollars. so with a put option let's say it's at 100 and it drops down to 50 you already sold at 90. So while everybody else has $40, $50 stocks, you have a bunch of $90 stocks that you cashed in. So that's how it works. So again, it's not trying to invest. It's not trying to make a lot of money. It's simply protection, guys. That Rolls Royce gets a big dent in it. They'll cut you a check for 10 grand to get it fixed. So yeah, um, yeah take those options. I Do mean, protect that stock. Dr. Emily, one guys is is seconding everything I'm literally saying. She, she, uh, he, she, I'm not sure exactly, um, you know, what the gender she is. Or their, you said their, <laughs> their preferred pronoun is, um, she's right, guys. Don't sell. Don't, don't sell. If your, if your investment horizon is long term, even if the market goes down, don't sell. Double down. Yeah. Buy more because you're going to be buying at a cheaper price and you're going to, yeah. it's going to go back up over time, guys. We have a hundred years of history. Um, to um to to back this now a question yeah, don't I, panic yeah a question i had from michael armstrong please explain the benefits of a roth 401k or a roth ira again guys 
a Roth IRA is just an after-tax account. Roth just means after-tax. That means that whatever goes in, you've already paid taxes on, okay? You don't get a tax benefit up front. Once you pay taxes on it, you get tax-free growth, growth, for as long as it's in that account, okay? And um, what happens is, is that the difference is between a traditional IRA and a Roth IRA is that a Roth IRA is a before-tax account. That means that once you put money into a traditional IRA or even a 401k that doesn't have a Roth option, if you put it in a 401k or before-tax account or a traditional IRA, you um, you get a tax benefit uh, up front in which you don't pay taxes on it at the moment that you put it in and you get a tax deduction. Um, and you get a, a you get a tax sheet for that. Again, you fill it out on your uh, your taxes and stuff like that. And that's just kind of how it goes. That's the yeah. that's the biggest difference. Um, now, in terms of a Roth 401k versus a Roth IRA, there's really no difference. I don't think companies match Roth um, for because just the way it's just set up regulatory. So, like I said, if you want to do a Roth portion of your 401k, go for it. But I not sure if companies uh match that portion of it i think they only match before tax contributions but you can check me on that you can check your plan i that's just from what i remember um that's how it works so like i said again the younger you are roth is the way to go and, the, and again the reason why is because the young when you're young you're gonna be making less money which means that you're gonna be paying um when you're young that means you're gonna be paying less taxes so you want to pay less taxes up front. Pay less taxes up front. Make your money grow. Remember, when you take your money out of your IRA, it comes out at your income tax rate. So that means that most likely when you're older, you're going to be making a lot more money than you were when you were younger, which means you're going to be owing more money when you get older, when it comes to your income is going to go up. So with the Roth IRA, the magic of that is that when you get older and you start earning more income, you're not going to have to pay those taxes because you paid it at a lower rate up front yeah and guys yeah. taxes go up over time we all know yeah. that that's what happens like if one thing is guaranteed taxes will go up your income yep. is probably going to go up that's why people want to talk about reparations the roth ira <laughs> is your reparations i'm telling you so if you're young 20 30 take advantage of that roth ira as soon as you can max that thing out i think it's like sixty five hundred dollars a year you can check me on that i don't remember off the top of my head um, and I think there's catch up contributions, uh, if you're over the age of 50 in which you can contribute an extra thousand, but that's what they call catch up contribution. Again, you can double check me on that. Um, and you know, also keep in mind guys with the Roth IRA, they're also, um, with IRAs, there's also certain limits, income limits, um, that may prevent you from getting all the tax benefits. I don't remember off the top of my head. You can, again, look those things up. Um, but again, if you call in any one of these big mutual fund companies, Vanguard, Fidelity, T. Rowe Price, um, Morgan Stanley, they will help explain this stuff to you. And you can get a, a expert, you know, explanation of all, how all this stuff works. All you got to do is just call in, talk to somebody for free. They'd be more than happy to do it. You don't need to pay for financial advice uh, for the most part when it comes to a lot of this stuff. You can manage it yourself. Also, another trick, too, if you're mm -hmm. saving for retirement and you don't want to get bogged down and trying to figure out what your asset allocation should be, there are these things that all these company um, companies offer called um, target retirement funds, where literally what they do is you can say target retirement 2060. They're going to set your portfolio up so that you have the target asset allocation for somebody that's going to retire in 2060 or 2050. It, this is simple yeah. stuff. You ain't got to do no work. All you got to do, put your money in it. And the asset allocation will change over time for you. If minimum, minimum, if you got a 401k and you don't know what to do with it, target retirement funds. Ask, do you have a target retirement fund? Because that will do literally all the work for you. Most target retirement funds, I know Vanguard, for example, they have it set up the same way I tell you, you guys to set up. Total stock market, total international stock, total bond, total international bond. That's the way they have it set up. They just modify it as time moves on. Uh, automatically is automatic and you're good to go um you, the only time you really need financial advice is if you really start making a lot of money you got a lot of llc's set up you got a lot of corporations set up you really making some big time money then you might need some trust administration you might want to start thinking about setting up a trust you know doing some some fancy sophisticated stuff to save more money on taxes um <laughs> so that's you know but for the average regular day mojo like me and you we don't need all that 
all the tools and knowledge are available. It's it's free. It's simple. You just got to take time to yeah. look it up. Yeah, there's so much information out there. I mean, um, and see, so the thing about these 401ks, I mean, everything can be automated, just like you said. Um, you don't have to be an expert. You have to hire an expert. Um, it could all be automated. And so if you don't know much about investing, um, if you automate it, then you don't have to worry about it. But if you want to actively invest, um, and I think we had a, a brother that talked about he had 4000 to save every month. If you want to actively invest, be sure to learn from someone who's doing it. Again, do not pay for these seminars. Don't pay to play yet. The only time you want to pay an expert is if you're heavily involved, if you have enough knowledge. Because if you're starting from zero knowledge and paying for knowledge, it's not going to help. Don't be lazy out there. Spend some time. Spend six months paper trading. You know, spend a year shadowing a real estate investor. But make sure you get a hands-on knowledge before you pay for something. It's just like the fitness industry. You don't want to hire a personal trainer when you're 400 pounds. <laughs> You know, and if anybody's 400 pounds out there, God bless you. But what you want to do if you have a weight problem, you want to make sure that you walk a few miles a day for about three, four months. You want to shave that down from 400 to about maybe 320, 330. And once you're in shape, once, you know, walking three or four miles doesn't affect you, you, you feel good about it, then you hire a personal trainer. Same thing with investing. You don't go from, I got a pile of money, don't know anything about investing. Let me pay some guy to, no. Learn for free, work for someone. You want to be a real estate investor, work for a real estate investor. Do all the menial tasks, make all the phone calls, drive all the properties for him, be his friend. Because in a year's time, you would have made that man a million dollars, but he would have gave you a billion dollars in knowledge. So don't be lazy, don't be greedy, don't be selfish. Learn from someone. You know, take advice from, from somebody like Greg about, about, you know, where to put your different mutual funds, different uh, IRAs. Do not depend on paying someone a ton of money because they're going to do it the way they've done it. And you, you can't take advice from someone who's going to do it different than you because that person has $2 million to invest. But he's going to invest your money, your 50000 like he does his $2 million, and it won't work. He made his $2 million off of a certain off of a certain way. He's going to do the same thing with your 50000 and it goes up in smoke a lot of times. I've seen it happen with, with many people. It's happened to me in the past because people do not know your own personal goals, your own personal finances. You have to figure out what that is, what your goals are, when you want to retire, how much can you save, how much are you going to make in the next few years, are you going to get a promotion, how much you have in the bank, how much do you expect, you have a kid going to college, do they need braces, figure out what's going on with your own personal situation, and then get under someone who you can, who you can be mentored by, but do not go out and spend money on some internet guy saying, hey, I can change your life in three days. Do it locally. And do it for free with people. Work for somebody for a few for a little while, but make sure that you have hands-on knowledge about what you're doing before you pay for it. Because let me tell you, if you're if you're shadowing, and I'm going to keep this at real estate. If you're shadowing a real estate person and you learn how to do real estate, and now you want to get bigger, you're going to have to hire those people. But at that time, you know real estate, so you can pretty much, you know, you can pay for that now because you know the game. But if you have zero knowledge and you're giving away a bunch of money to get help, a lot of times you're going to get burned. So don't be lazy. Do the leg work first. Don't open your wallet. Leg work. That's what's going to make it happen for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I 100% agree with that. Nicole uh, Rob uh, says, what age or income should you stop investing in Roth and just invest in a regular 401k? Um, I think we kind of went over this a little bit. Um, generally speaking, this is what in the financial planning industry, this is generally what they agree upon is max out your 401k first. And then once you max that out, you always just want to keep contributing. That. You want to keep uh, doing that because, again, if there's a max a uh, match portion of it, that's free money. Nothing can beat free money. The company is giving you money. Nothing can beat that. What you want to do is match that max that out. And if you have more and you still want to save more for retirement, then you can go to the Roth, 
right? As long as you are eligible to invest in the IRA, you're good to go. You you you're good to go, and just just do it. Um, so there there's really no age or income where you should stop investing as long as you're eligible for the for the IRA. Just in general, if you're looking at the priority in terms of what to invest in, even at any age, you should 401k if there's a match, max that out. And um, if you have some left over, and you still want to continue to save for retirement, then go raw. That's if you're if you you know in general. However, if you're younger, you really want to think hard harder about doing a little bit of both because that after tax save savings that you're going to get from that Roth IRA is going to be great. Um, and when you're younger, it's really going to benefit you. So you probably want to do more a little bit of both um, when you're when you're younger in terms of the Roth versus 401k. Um, but still, you can't go wrong. Max out the 401k first and then go on Roth. Or if, again, like I said, if you're younger, you can do, you know, a little bit of both, but just make sure you're taking advantage of both, right? If you can, that's really what it comes down to. It, it really comes down to preference in terms of what you want to do, but take advantage of both. F nothing beats free money. Yeah. <laughs> and and, and, and tax-free yeah. and tax-free um, um, investments and, 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 and gains over time. Nothing beats that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and like I said, you know, get your own business, get your own businesses started. You know, go to, now you can go to LegalZoom once you've gotten a, a good piece of knowledge on how to do it. You know, talk to an accountant and account and don't be intimidated by accountants. You know, they're, they're not that expensive, but they'll pretty much help you set up to where you can have your own business. And if you, you don't have to have a product to sell, you don't have to buy some office, your home can be your office. But make sure you open your own business, get an EIN number. Because once you replace your social security number with an EIN, everything is tax deductible. Some things you wouldn't believe as tax deductible will be tax deductible. So instead of you spending money, you'll be getting a lot of that money back. And it comes in handy. Even if it's 200 bucks a month, that can make a huge difference. That's an electricity bill. For some people, that's a car note. If you got a Kia, you know, it's a buck 35 a month. So, you know, think about that, too. You know, don't just go out and spend money willy nilly. If you have tax advantages that the government gives you, the government gives you tax advantages. Now, they give it to the rich, but you can take advantage of that, too. It's not the rich use it the most, but, you know, regular Joes like us can use it, too. So, you know, look into that. It's not it's not a make or break. But at the same time, if, if you're really trying to stretch your dollar and have some growth, Open a business and make everything tax deductible. It will it will save a ton of money over the long term, especially on taxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I I, I agree with that. Now make sure you have a you know a legitimate business. Um, you know, when you when you do that and you open up a business, make sure you're actually trying to sell a product, <laughs> you know, yeah. to take advantage of those deductions. But, you know, Generally speaking, like I said, it is something where people, you know, you want to have a side hustle. If, like I said, even if you're a Uber driver or you do Postmates or whatever in your in your spare time, yeah. you know that those gas is tax deductible, mileage is tax deductible. Those things you want to take advantage of, you're making a little bit of extra money, and you know, again, that extra money you can use to save for retirement. You know, that's yeah, it is what it is. Um, Mommy Harris says, "What about precious metals?" Again, I'm not a big fan of precious metals. Um, I think they're too volatile. They definitely have a place in your portfolio, um, but they have a very, very small place. I would probably say no more maximum 5% exposure, in yeah. my opinion. Yeah. But, you know, again, you know, a lot of people are gun ho about, you know, precious metals and gold, and I'm, I'm just not. So that's just me. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a big fan of metals either, but they, again, they, they do go up. I mean, just look at metals from, you know, 1990, 2000 to what the prices are now. They, they've double quadrupled. So um, precious metals, yes, but like he said, uh, a small percentage, but the largest percentage are indexes. That's where you're going to have the most steady growth without a huge amount of risk. Yeah. And you can, you can buy put options on indexes too. Let's say that you have, let's say that you're investing in S&P 500, um, and that's at about $3,400 right now. If it falls to 2100 like it did earlier in the year, you can actually have put options on that too. 
and the put options are very cheap. So any any asset that you have in the stock market, make sure you have put options against it just in case. And again, you're not trying to invest with put options. You're not trying to kill the market. All you're doing is saying, hey, it's October 2020. I'm going to buy options from to April 2022. If there's a crash, I'll get paid. And if it doesn't crash, then fine. You spent the minimum amount of money. It's insurance. There's not always going to be an accident. You're going to pay thousands of dollars before there's an accident. But once it is one, once there's a crash, you will get a ton of money. Your 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 um your money could double in some cases with the right type of crash or the right type of option buy. So um yeah and and again this entire shows just ways to save money and what to do with the money you save it's you know what vehicles to use and we're we're going broad but if you want anything specific you can contact greg or contact me and we'll we'll get into specifics for you yeah guys um like anybody that comes on my you know live stream that is you know uh has some expertise i feel like i'm kind of developed out a network here i got my, my boy duran for you know uh loans and, and credit and, and and just practical financial advice and then i got uh mario he's an attorney so he can get a little bit yeah. deeper on that stuff um follow him on uh on subscribe to his youtube channel at uh duran Wim show i think it's star uh subscribe um i think you can you know like say you 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 know, you you t you go in the chat and put your YouTube channel yep. there. He has a YouTube channel. He has, you know, some good information. He has some interesting takes on politics um, and, and things of that nature that, you know, it's I think it's just really cool to get exposed to all different points of view. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're about to hit two hours here. So um, yeah. I think that it's about 10 o'clock. I think that, um, you know, we uh, we we've kind of hit. A lot of different things uh, broadly. I'm um, just kind of looking out for more questions, um, and you know, just to kind of see if anybody got any last minute things. But um, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, what we did. It wasn't very formal. We were just, um, you know, kind of going over different things. And it, it, this is something I really wanted to do because, you know, talking about you know Ice Cube and Diddy, I feel like they could be doing a lot more. You know, they should be talking yeah. about this type of stuff. You know, they should do more of this mm -hmm. than than sitting around, you know, begging people for money and handouts when you got investment vehicles and and tax advantage uh, savings accounts that are readily available to the public that too many people don't know about. Um, so I'm doing my part. I'm putting my money where my mouth is and, and, and giving people knowledge that practical knowledge that they can use um, right now. Um, you can open up an account at Fidelity, Vanguard, uh, Morgan Stanley. Um, you know, T Roll Price, um, all these brokerage houses, you can you can go out here and open up an account right now and apply the advice that I've given you. This is free stuff, you know. Um I'm more than happy to give it out for free. Um yeah. and, and, and help anybody that I can because more people should know this stuff. Absolutely. Yeah, and I, I wanna close with this. Everything, and especially to my black my brothers, my sisters. Every resource you need is is attainable. Any sort of knowledge, any sort of you know financial windfall, any sort of you know special class or any sort of course, everything is available to you. You have to search it. The government they they're, they're going to do certain things to help, but at the same time, the help starts with you. And you know, brothers and sisters, the most important thing you can do for yourself is keep your family together. You know, we have too many fatherless homes. You know, we have too many mothers out there just willy nilly. You know, keep the family strong. Save your money. Don't try to bling bling. <laughs> most importantly, <laughs> most importantly, gather as much financial knowledge that you can. Financial knowledge and financial growth, that is the best education you can give yourself. Just little tidbits about credit, little tidbits about real estate, little tidbits about 401ks. That, that could go a long way. And imagine you, you're listening to this show right now. You change a few habits. Now you're $100,000 richer in five years, 10 years. What would that do for your family, for your kids, for your grandkids to have an extra $100,000 just from some bits of knowledge from a two-hour show? So keep yourself informed and keep yourself active and busy. Yeah, man. I, I second that. Um, 
like I said, it's 10 o'clock. It's hitting two hours here. Um, thank you guys so much. I appreciate you guys tuning in. I didn't know how this was go. Uh, let me know if, um, you know, you guys liked it. Uh, maybe we'll do another one. Um, but you know, if, you know, if not, maybe not, but I'm pretty sure we gave out some pretty good advice. So I think it'll be, I think it'll be good. Any last words, Duran? Yeah. Um, you know, I want, I want to thank you guys for listening. Uh, I want to thank you guys for your questions and there's a lot of professionals in this group. Um, I, I've had real estate owners. I've seen people with multiple properties and, uh, 401ks. There was one guy who can save 4,000 a month. So, you know, there, there's a lot of people who are seeking this knowledge and, um, you know, it, it, I mean, politics are great, but um, also financial education. And you, you can't, I mean, certain certain shows are, are more useful, like right now, you know, the politics, it, it's the most political time I've ever seen. I mean, they're throwing, you know, stuff back and forth like I've never seen. They actually wish death on the president on CNN. I've, ne <laughs> I, I've never seen They've that. They've been hoping he'd get corona wish, for a while. Yeah, like if they would have wished death on Ronald Reagan, I'm old school. If they would have wished death on Ronald Reagan on CNN, it would have been they would have unplugged CNN that that day. So the politics are getting heated. So what you do, Greg, is very needed. We need the right perspective on politics. We need to look at politics a little bit differently. Black people are not a monolith. Black people don't all think alike. We need to cut that out. All the sellout, all the sellouts, all the coons, <laughs> just because we have a different opinion. We all want black people to do better. If you want to go to the right, fine. If you want to go to the left, fine. We all want to end up at the same place. So we have to have some sort of unity. Yes, we have different opinions on how to get there. The most important thing is we both want to get there. So try to share ideas. Don't try to judge. Just try to, if you don't agree, fine, but just agree on the fact that we want betterment for our people. Start there and then try to find a common ground. None, none of the sell out and coon stuff. That does nothing but shut our ears and shut our minds and puts us in the same place we've been for the last hundred years. Yeah. Let's try to grow as people. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the ultimate goal of my channel, guys, like I said, I, know, I talk a lot of politics, but ultimate goal is really to put my money where my mouth is and provide the resources and to basically, you know, uh, walk the walk, you know, just like I talk to talk and, and, and like I said, put myself out there and say, Hey guys, this stuff is available. Knowledge is available. You're not a victim. Um, you have all the opportunity available. And it's not just for black people. It's not just for black people. It's for white, black, Hispanic, yeah. Asian, and whoever. I, I want Everybody. my channel to be a resource where people can come and get and get get knowledge. And we don't, you know, wallow in victimhood. And, yeah, I support President Trump. You know, I'm conservative. I'm going to support Republicans because I want to pay less taxes. But, you know, at the same time, first and foremost comes helping people out and doing the right thing. That's what comes first. Yeah. And, and it is what it is. Um, and like I said, we, it's not just about being black or white. It's, it's really about just being Americans and as Americans, we should help each other out and, you know, take care of each other. Um, and the best way to take care of each other is by sharing knowledge. So I'm going to go yeah. ahead and close out with that. Um, uh, make sure you guys subscribe to Duran's channel. He has some, uh, great information. He's, uh, very interesting, uh, perspectives. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and end this stream and y'all have a good night. I appreciate it. Thanks guys. All right, man. Peace. Peace out.